Now let me uh, invite to the uh, to the to the stage uh, Professor uh, Ferenc uh, Mislivets, the UNESCO Chair and Director General of the IASC, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Kursag, the architect of, of, of this meeting, the architect of IASC, and the architect of many other things, and hope that he will be also an architect of peace in Ukraine. So come over here. I don't know what is the how to how to manipulate this. I push the top button. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Andras, um, and 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 um, thank you, Jody, accepting that I, I skipped my lecture and now I give you a short version of it. So I'm not showing all of the slides I, I was preparing with, um, but but it's true. I, I actually wanted to be an architect. I mean, I mean, yes, so I, I probably, it was a very, very strong, sorry to talk about myself, but the very strong um, uh, obsession almost. I went to school to study mathematics and physics at the, the gymnasium. The very last minute I changed my mind. I don't give you the details why. That, that is good for architecture, right? Yeah, but I, it, 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 <laughs> it, it no, I remain, it was a suppressed, aborted architect, so this is why I'm doing what I'm doing in Kursa. So, okay, I'm not sure that I can be alone, and I'm not alone, the architect of what, what is I ask, the fantastic, fantastic friends and colleagues, um, and we have started it much before I ask existed, as I, I told you, so this is like a three decades, three, or more than 35 years uh, process, which is not the topic of, of today's lecture, but it's, it's, it's good to mention that what you, um, that you experience here, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a long-term long work, desire, attempt, aspiration to bring people together, exchange views and listening to each other. And that's, that has become, that's true, more important in my understanding than anything else. That we can dig deep in our disciplines and find new facts and new, new methods, etc. in physics, mathematics, sociology or economics, but to, 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 to dialogue, uh, to exchange views and to listen, especially when we do it, not agree with each other. And to learn, that is probably, and very fast, we do this very fast, we don't have time. I just gave an interview to one of the Hungarian um, uh, um, media agency, and uh, after like 15 years, we started to talk about the crises, interwoven, multi-layered, um, hydra-headed crises, which the media completely ignored. They said, the mainstream, Hungarian liberal media, said, well, this is just a 89, 2008, that is just only, um, yeah, one of those crises and the business as usual is coming back. So there's a lagging behind, and now, this part of my message here, because we don't, do not know how to communicate, we do not know how to communicate, and there is very little exchange between those who should exchange their views. And I think all of us in university business, in academia, in journalism, politics, diplomacy are responsible for that. And this war is, I think, like a lachmus test. It shows how important honest and deep communication is. So I, I produced a paper which I think everyone received, and that is um, the attempt to, to write the second part of it, to be sanctioning the future. And I changed the title with new chapters of war, peace, and the violence in the 21st century, because we did not t talk especially um, about violence. Um, Sir Richard mentioned that, and, and that is true. He actually predicted the future. This rarely happens. It be this clarity in his book written in 2016. He exactly described uh, the model of, of intervention, etc., the Russian aggression. <clears throat> and, and as also he very well describes his um, colleagues, bosses, etc., within NATO and also in, in British politics, did not did not listen. In fact, they he, they wanted to punish him. And this, you you should read the the uh, the introduction of the book um, because he just told them the truth. And this is what we experience in social sciences, um, in, in the academia. But you come with uh, with a, with a new insight, a new idea. They say that is this is rubbish. That's ideology. That's not going to happen. 
And so in our, in our best and word, I think we are creating the obstacles of understanding complexities ourselves, yeah? With our institutions, which are petrified and old fashioned, and, and of course create for those who work there a certain safety, uh, security if you want financially or, or giving some prestige, but we are blocking each other from understanding a present and a future which is getting incredibly and, and increasingly complex. So now um, I should... It was the level of violence. Yeah, you could predict the war, and Russia did what you have described. And e even the, this, uh, you remember, at the beginning of the war, we were afraid in Europe that, um, that the Baltics will be occupied. And Ukraine is just um, a little begin. That was, the, the, yes, you could predict it, but the amount and the brutality of violence was not predictable. And that is one of my, I don't know, messages, but uh, conclusions that <clears throat> agreeing with Hannah Arendt, violence, when it starts uh, and it takes a form of a <clears throat> social um, game, it's not predictable. Okay, so but this is the, the, the problem here is that there were a lot of predictions and, and govern, governance and governments did not listen. Um, we don't have time to discuss it. Not only about the war, about COVID, about climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh. Yes. Maps, yes. Geography, yes, it does count. Um, <clears throat> you can see how how, how NATO uh, and Russia looked before and after 91. And <clears throat> we just discussed it with my colleagues um, during the break. It, there are two different things, is to understand the motivation, the aspirations of your counterpart. Yeah? Try to understand, use your intuition and sensitivity, etc. but does not mean that you agree or you accept that. And it was, Predictable, and it was it came out very well from um, uh, from Isha um, Shirev's talk that it was predictable that the Russians are going to react, and Putin said so in 2008 that he actually talked about a red line, and NATO, as led by Americans, did not care, and for that we need more research why and how it happened. There was a famous NATO meeting where Putin was present. Yeah. <clears throat> so one thing is that we do not agree with the culture of violence, the culture of, I don't know, uh, doing politics um, as it happens in the Russian Empire. This is not really our culture. Yeah? That, that, that if it is predictable that if you do things which they take provocation, then the consequent, consequence might be war and bloodshed. That should have been taken more seriously. Um, Yes, I, I have to skip because um, it's not, there's no time for that. Um, yes. Um, the unpredictability of violence. Yes, we are an, a, about, about a, around the beginning of the, the neoliberal world order, but it still exists. It still has a lot of institutions, and especially the mainstream media. Um, and, and, and other institutions, the, the less and less useful international organizations. Yes, UN was mentioned, UNESCO was mentioned, other security, um, ge uh, uh, regional security institutions, they are completely paralyzed. They, they can't do anything. Guterres, the, the general secretary of, of UN, every second week says, oh, terrible, we are heading towards more and more danger. The, the world is becoming more and more. Dead. This is where are the blue helmets? But is any any suggestion from the UN side for any real solution? Nothing. That is a that is an expression of a deep crisis. And that we do not talk about it. We pretend we in the Western world at least, as if this these institutions would function. They not. They are not functioning. Okay. So in, in, as a consequence. You know, probably you heard this many times here from, from us, and I ask 
divided societies, increasing polarization. Look at United States, look at Great Britain. It's not um, United Kingdom, this United Kingdom. is the United Nations is this United Nations. So that's what I told you in my preface, in my introduction, that the, the, the concepts we use are turning against themselves. They are undermined. I mean, they, they are, the content is lost, and, and, and it bec becomes negative. Um, yes. The final question, which nobody knows the answer for, how to make peace, and who can guarantee a new peace order? Yeah? Well, there were some, some, some politician statesmen who, who, who raised their hands, Erdogan, for sure, he would never, we never do that after this tragedy in Turkey. And, but others too, yeah? I don't want to mention too many names. The who? Yeah? That we have some people, um, politicians in Hungary as well, um, people, one million Germans, but peace now, yes. Yeah? So if, if there would be a ceasefire, I mean, sure, it would counter you. Who would guarantee peace? Okay, look, this is a very telling uh, photo of three people. Um, Richard, yeah. Sorry? No, no, but if we have Putin, look at the, the difference in, in faces. Um, it was Gorbachev was only, you know, I mean, he was until 91, he was the first man of the Soviet Union and, 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 and then you, you know, and, and he offered the word, the Western word, cooperation, and they were great. European politicians, Mitterrand and Kohl, and even Americans who agreed. I mean, that was a general agreement. You might say today, oh, it was illusion. Uh, it was not supported by, by arms, by armies. But there was an agreement, and Gorbachev did something, and Mr. Putin would not exist with, uh, uh, without Gorbachev. So there was a very interesting Shakespearean moment. Someone criticized him that he did not go to the funeral. He did, alone a day before. And there was a very famous photo of Gorbachev standing alone with the coffin of Gorbachev and watching him with a, a bouquet of flower, flowers. The, he wouldn't exist without, and Viktor Orban either, either. I mean, our politicians, um, thanks to their existence, because Gorbachev created a, a global situation, disarmament, etc., when it was possible for us in Eastern Central Europe to, to, to do what we did, yeah, peaceful, velvet revolutions, whatever it was. Uh, okay, um, there's a very interesting point, and and it's, it, it 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 directs to our, our discussion. How many Russia exists? There was a um, ten, twelve years ago, Natalia Zubarovich, an interesting um, mind and sociologist and geographer, who who talked about four different kinds of Russia. Maybe we have here in the room uh, our colleagues and friends from Russia who could who could tell us more in details. So uh, uh, maybe one tenth, fifteen percent of Russian population, yeah, our colleagues, friends in academia, etc., are like us. There's no difference in thinking. Maybe a little bit in culture, but I don't think so. But those are either gone or are silenced or in prison, etc. So there is a very European, very Western, and then there are um, a, a layer of, of Russian society. Then the blue collar workers, and then. More people who are more manipulable, but 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 people are manipulable, are manipulated almost all over the world, not only in Russia. Um, <clears throat> so it's very dangerous to create uh, us against them. It is dangerous for ourselves. It's dangerous for the potential of the peace. You can say, yeah, go on, go on, come here." I, I never. Uh, so my name is Hanya Tepavcevic. I'm one of the speakers of this conference, and I'm ask. I ask researcher. Very proud of it. Um, here, I never wrote that paper because I had too many things to do. <laughs> but uh, I would add one, and probably the most important fifth Russia here, and that is the Kremlin. When we talk about Russia we usually talk exactly about that one Russia. And all of these four Russias are usually overseen. So th they're not really in the, in the discourse. And thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. 
that school on. Um, yes. Um, that the miscalculation of Putin was discussed already. We can skip that. There's a cartoon. I skipped all the cartoons because there's nothing to laugh about. But this is not a cartoon. This is quite telling. It's true without US and NATO, this war could not be waged. But if there's a paradox with US and NATO, it seems to me that this war cannot be won either. That's the paradox. Yeah? Because we cannot go too far. They cannot use F-16 and, and the tanks. So yeah, giving the, the tanks and not to give them the, because we want to avoid nuclear war. But that's what Putin knows. And I'm coming back to this at the end. Yeah, here is something what, um, again, it's too much to read. What Shank Liri told me, I wasn't aware of this. There was a chance if we had this heroic West who wants to you know, protect and defend, in March, very soon after the war broke out, to use the, the method of no-fly zone. Some people, maybe, maybe Richard would, um, wouldn't agree with me, or uh, <clears throat> there was a chance that, that the UN, not the, um, uh, the, the General Assembly, um, not the Security Council, would kind of support um, Ukraine's effort to create a no-fly zone above Ukraine. That could have stopped the escalation of war. I'm asking rather than stating this, um, that would have caused probably life, yeah? Yeah, American, um, uh, American pilots, etc. But that could have been stopped the war at the very beginning. Do, do you don't agree? OK. No, OK. Well, that's, that's one, one, one illusion less. OK, one illusion less. Go further. Um, these are three scenarios uh, of our Russian colleague and friend, Andrei Kortunov, who is leading uh, um, a, a, a well-known um, NGO, um, think tank in Moscow, the Russian International Affairs Council, uh, RIAC. He says that these three scenarios are plausible. Um, the victory of liberal hegemony uh, looks like a far away possibility today to me. No winner scenario, that's quite realistic. <laughs> Uh, the military conflict ends uh, indecisively. The West is forced to compromise with China, and this leads to a reform of the global order. Mm -mm. Uh, and the third one is still a danger, I think, the incessant conflict scenario. I mean, chaos and more violence and more war. Um, we should probably discuss it. Um, here is a promise. Again, it's waiting, but it, when I read it first, um, last, um, last October, I was a little, little, how to say, I was more hopeful than I'm today. Um, the, new, the, 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 the chance for a new European construction. The European construction was halted. After the East West, the Eastern enlargement, um, there was no real understanding between the newcomers, East Central Europeans, and the Western part of, 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 of the European Union. And it seems that, that there was a wake up call and some positive reactions to create a European political community. The first meeting happened already with 44 countries. We don't have a political community. And this is why we have the American tutelage in, in NATO altogether, yeah? This is why we do not have a European, why don't we have a European army? If you add all the armies, the, 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 the members, yeah, the, the number of soldiers, the tanks, etc., all together, if you could integrate it, it would be much more powerful than any other armies in the world. But we don't have it. Why? Good question. We can discuss it. OK, so th that was what Borrell said in uh, October 6. And the next meeting, the second meeting, will be in Moldova, <coughs> if it happens, June 1st. Good luck for us. This is um, may maybe um, Emil can add, add something to this, if it is plausible or not. Um, then other um, good moment was when I read um, Olaf Scholz's um, <clears throat> a speech at Prague University, he spoke about the same, and um, that Germany is ready for a leading military role to ensure Europe's security, question mark. I do not know, and I don't see it. I, I, maybe they consider, maybe, but I think that the German trauma uh, of, after the Second World War is too, is, it, it went too deep. And, and if you see German politicians discussing the issues with Zelensky, you see that they are tortured. 
they cannot, they, they cannot say. I mean, and Putin knows this very well. This he says that tanks, yeah, again, he's telling uh, 100 million people who only watch one channel, here you again, we have the Nazis coming back with the same tanks, we have to defend our motherland. That was, again, predictable. So go further very quickly. Um, yeah, I talked to you, I mentioned the common European army, and here is the nuclear threat. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the number of warheads and the strengths. Unfortunately, um, the non-Western capacity is greater, bigger than the Western one. If, if you say that India and Pakistan is kind of um, swinging states. And yes, and here I understand that um, the United States and Western Europe um, is, are very cautious and, and are afraid to provoke um, Putin and the Russian army too much. And, but where is the limit? This is a, how to say it, a situation that Putin can blackmail the Western world. And he does. So that's that's my that's the end of my. Um, uh, um, here it is. Um, the, the citations with the tanks. Oh, that's a good that's a good cartoon. Uh, the, a lot of yes, yes, we yes, we give them. Yeah, comes uh, out as a no. And um, that is the question: I, Is there a third way? Tertium non datur or tertium datur. This is um, this is which we probably should discuss. Um, if you read um, the literature, um, you don't get very um, optimistic. Ken Follett just finished the novel, Never, which messages that um, we have a, a, a new um, American um, president, a lady who is in the middle of the road, he's conservative, but not like Trump. He, she wants peace and, and, and that her life mission is to avoid with every means nuclear war. And it's described very, in a very smart way at the end, in a bunker or wherever she is hiding, she has to push the button. And um, the conclusion is, from Hannah Arendt, is this just uh, a couple of questions to you and for the discussion. Um, why is violence breaking out? Why is warfare still with us in the nuclear age when we know that the nuclear war is not a possibility. A secret death wish of humans or an irrepressible instinct of aggression or, that's an under-discussed question, the economic and social danger inherent in disarmament, the military-industrial complex's interest, or because there is no final arbiter in international affairs. That he, Putin does it because he can do it. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you.